here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week it's going to be the turn of Des Penny, the one-time manager of Flowered Up. And um, also he co-wrote several of the songs, or quite a lot of them. So, um, yes, and also, this is very exciting, so I should tell you about it. There is a new book uh, that's just come out titled Believe in Magic which is a history of heavenly recordings. The first 30 years that has just come out by, um, by Robin Turner, who did the PR at the time. Anyway, the point is, um, there is a section on, in the book about Flowered Up. So do check it out and go and buy a copy, because it is absolutely fantastic. Um, but this is going to be the interview, and after several minutes of casual chat with Des talking about this and that, we got down to that very exciting subject that was the early formative Yes, Des, tell us more. Well, it's funny you should mention Sweet because I think that um, I think that was probably one of the first singles I bought. Um, Blockbuster. Um, yes. When I was, I mean, I was born in '67, so I'd have been I'd have been really young. Um, you know, probably about I don't know six years old or something like that. But I probably pestered like my mother or my father to get me it or something. Um, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it was quite varied I think like when I when I was like of a young age because um what I can vividly remember from our household was that um Sunday afternoons was very much a top 40 afternoon and we would sit and listen to the to Radio 1 and, and the and the, the top 40 and the, and the countdown you know um so it was kind of like you know those those like Elton John and sort of <clears throat> whatever was going on then. And I remember sort of having a bit of an obsession with um, Billy Don't Be a Hero. <laughs> it's a classic. It's a, but it's interesting because I'd vaguely forgotten that radio, the the Sunday kind of, I don't know if it was very a very early evening and listening to this countdown and everyone yeah. having to sort of go, oh my God, what's the next one? Oh my God, they've gone down or gone up three places because yeah, yeah. people only yeah. went up and down like by two or three places and a record would be in the charts for months before it you know yeah it yeah a, yeah and it was quite a religious experience i mean it was kind yeah, of weird yeah, yeah, yeah totally totally and, and uh, in our house it was it was you know it was something that was r- r- like ritually done every sunday like uh, i think it was early evenings up like between four and five or something like that in the in, in the early evening yeah. um and so like you know early on it was kind of like <clears throat> whatever was playing really and and the songs that kind of i remember was like sweet i remember mud tiger feet and i remember daniel by elton john yeah. you know those kind of songs that kind of stuck in my head a little bit some of the glitter band stuff um but i never really kind of latched onto anything um at that age or never really had any hankerings for, for like being a pop star or sort of wanting to pick up an instrument. And it was really the, the, the irony, I suppose, was that my father was a drummer and he used to play in skiffle bands and jazz bands um, where, before he'd married my mother. Mm. Um, and I can remember him always sitting around and, and tapping out beats and sort of sometimes he'd have a couple of saucepans and he'd be whacking away on them with like a, you know a couple of kitchen utensils or something um much later on in my life i I actually picked up the drums and um started to learn really really quickly and i developed like by this stage my father had left our household and he you know i I didn't have any contact with him and i developed this kind of hatred for him at never ever sticking the drumsticks in my hands when i was a kid Mm -hmm. and just letting me find my own way you know and i could never understand even to this day i could never understand why you wouldn't pass that on to your to your child whether they pick it up or not is their thing you know yeah. but you you would surely at least try um or try to influence it a little bit you know and pass it on um but it wasn't until really i suppose um that i sort of i suppose um just prior to becoming a teacher probably like about sort of 11 years old i started my older sister um would be very into the soul scene at that point 
jazz funk and British funk, you know, and, and reggae right. and stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd hear this coming from her bedroom and, and stuff. Like prior to that, she'd been really into David Essex and the Bay City Rollers and things. But like, as she became a slightly older teenager, she started getting into reggae and soul music and funk and stuff. And, uh, and, and this kind of, I, um, I latched onto that and I really, really went for that, you know, and, um, and so, um, you know, I'd be borrowing her records and like, I really wanted to get my own record deck, you know, and, and, and then it was still like, you know, the, the stack of sevens that dropped one by one. Yes. <laughs> deck, you know. <laughs> yes, we remember that. Yes, very. And they would skid. Um, if you had too many, they would start skidding. So you'd have to yeah, sort of yeah, take yeah, some totally, off. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, and, and then, and then uh, sort of like as I kind of became sort of 12 and 13 and, and kind of getting more confident at secondary school and stuff, then it, very quickly I started getting into the jam and and you know and and kind of the remnants of the punk scene and sort of clash and and then, and then it started really mixing up you know it started really kind of entwining my musical taste it became very very varied you know um I didn't dislike soul and stuff like that anymore it wasn't a case of jumping sort yeah. of like from this to this it was it just became very eclectic you know and I started I started realizing that I just really liked music, you know, and I, I liked the fashions that went with them. I liked, you know, all, kind of the whole, the whole deal, you know, if there was any lingo involved with it or if, you know, and I remember going to, um, uh, you know, and I, I would dress like as a soul boy at, at some points, you know, I would never, I would never kind of, go into a fashion and then stay rigidly in it sort of thing. I would kind of like maybe like one day dress a bit like a soul boy and then I'd start sort of maybe mixing it up a little bit with whatever, you know, there was no kind of set rule. And then I could kind of start bringing in a little bit of mod stuff or something, you know, like some stay press or something or, you know, so it was kind of like a mixed bag. But I do remember going to... Um, one of the last jam gigs at Wembley Arena and there was like a whole group of us went from my estate and we all dressed like mods, you know, so there was like this little group of us, you know, and I remember having like a turtleneck pair of state press and desert boots and we all went, you know, and I had my girlfriend and it was kind of like, you know, it was, <laughs> it was our own little quadrophenia sort of thing, if you like, you know yeah. what I mean? You know, that was our fantasy sort of, but you know, and then the, the, the next week I'm, I might be dressing in like a, a kind of MA1 jacket and with rolled up jeans and a pair of DMs or something, you know, and and um, listening to the specials or whatever, you know, and it's just, it was kind of very, I was, I was, I was kind of like a bit of a, a, a chameleon like that. Yes, you know, I was going like, to, I was going to mention the C word there. Yeah, it's quite yeah. interesting because, because, because I don't know, I just remember in the 70s that people were really tribal and where I grew up, we, you know, status quo were the band that you just didn't ever, just didn't say anything bad against if you get beaten <laughs> up, you know, the quo <laughs> fan. But I remember sort of quite liking some of the two-tone stuff like the B and knowing that if you just even looked like you enjoyed it, you might have got punched by someone who called you a poof, probably. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah, you yeah. had to be quite careful on, on the quo front. So it was quite a tribal, it was like basically rockers with lots of denim you know and headbangers yeah yeah yeah, yeah but that yeah. was kind of that that kind of neighborhood really in that kind of country so a bit of a it was I suppose it was quite country really it wasn't very punk definitely didn't come come to east anglia very early <laughs> <laughs> but you grew up in london then yeah i grew up in central london so um basically around the corner from euston station <clears throat> Um, yes. there's a, a council estate called Regent's Park Estate which is obviously like kind of in between Euston Station and Regent's Park um, and it's it's uh, it's a probably what from from my kind of experience of council estates in London it's probably one of the nicer ones in respect of it's pretty much low rise and like lots of green space and obviously you've got Regent's Park as pretty much your back garden you know um, so it was uh it it was it had a really nice vibe about it as well and i remember lots of people coming from different estates and they would always hang around for like weeks you know and 
they keep coming back to our estate because like our youth clubs were brilliant and like just the vibe of the estate was was great you know I mean obviously it went through its times as well there was a lot of racial tension and stuff going through the late 70s early 80s and stuff and you know the normal stuff you get within a city is you know the drugs and the rest of it you know and um and the same issues that working class places if you you know for want of a better way of putting it issues that they bring up you know like with um broken families and and kind of you know lots of uh alcoholism and drug addiction and pov like kind of poverty really you know there was there was people in poverty there were people that would have to buy their clothes from jumble sales you know otherwise they didn't they weren't clothed you know otherwise yeah. and stuff like that you know but um you know if you think about uh like other council estates you know in in in, cent in central london or or just around sort of thing they always seemed a lot worse you know i, th I think of like uh um like going just going across uh the thames into um elephant castle and some of the council estates there were just these massive gray entities of like concrete you know and it was like and it was just wow it just looked so depressing do you know what i mean yeah. there wasn't a tree in sight and like once you're in that estate you can't see anything but the sky you know and 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 that's it you know because i can remember i remember in the early 80s because i was you know i loved by um films back then i suppose there was a mike lee film wasn't there called meantime that featured people like i don't know the guy from quadrophenia and tim roth that's and a right. few other that's and, right. and it was really depressing because it was just yeah, like yeah, this, yeah. this group of people and families who just just wouldn't go in nowhere fast but it was just sitting yeah, there yeah yes yeah. did you see that film i did yeah many you've just reminded me of it actually many 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 years ago um one of my ex-girlfriends was doing an English degree while I was with her and she was uh she was really into Mike Lee stuff um yes. and she she got me to watch quite a lot of uh films and, and even go to uh watch some plays and stuff you know and and um it introduced me to stuff like that and it was really really interesting you know because I'd never I'd never really seen kind of like a what I'd call realist movie making you know it always been sort of like you know the stuff that would be at the cinema and kind of a bit more blockbustery sort of thing you know yes rocky effect. <laughs> yeah 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 and whatever you know but um like thinking about that meantime it's kind of like you know it makes me think of like i don't know if you ever see the film nil by mouth yes you know and it kind of it, in a way reminds same kind of vibe that kind of dark depressive sort of like kind of realist vibe to it you know which um <clears throat> just seems i i'd imagine it would seem to some people like does this really happen but it does it's very real you know it's it's quite a good take on real life you know? yes well i think like lee and uh, ken roach would always be able to depict those kind of scenes and yeah. i think if you didn't leave the cinema feeling incredibly depressed they hadn't done their job but mostly you yeah, felt yeah, very depressed because totally, yeah. you just thought yeah. fucking hell that's just yeah so tragic and um yeah, and, yeah, one, and you could i think the thing is you could always imagine that if you'd been born in a different place you, that would be your, your life in in that kind of world well, you, you know i've i've you know it, it, at periods it was you know it, it very much so you know i've been through periods of my life where where that has been the, the norm you know and um it's been very dark and gray and and kind of you know it's at times you don't see um you don't see the the horizon you don't see the sun rising at all <laughs> you know it's just it's just non-existent and you don't ever see it um there's not even a hope of it rising at some no, point you know? it's just kind of gray concrete just, yeah but like literally like you're you're in a place where even if it was a sunny day you wouldn't notice it you're just like locked into kind of like a uh, I, you know, obviously, I, I suffer with depression and and um, mental health issues along those lines. You know, so I, I I really have truly lived that that kind of day. You know, and it's it's um yeah, it's 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 I, I do empathise with anybody that that goes through that because uh, it it kind of seems almost like um when when you're not in that state, it's like unrealistic. It's almost like it was 
somebody else's life you know um because it's just so different to what you what you live when you're not in that state it's two completely um separate things which seem alien to each other when, yes. when you're in either one you know yeah absolutely um, it's a it's a difficult one and yeah, you don't know yeah, when it yeah. and you don't know when it's going to pass and you don't know when it's going to you know alter and you wonder if this is it and that's i think when especially a lot of people can just get very very low with it and, and struggle yeah, yeah 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 i mean i i i truly do understand how people go to to points where that where they you know mm. want to just cut out and they've had enough you know but also understand the other the, the other side of it where people are just so elated you know they they kind of um they just want to stay there forever <laughs> yeah Either, either end of the spectrum is unrealistic, you know, because you just couldn't live at either end of the spectrum for all of your life. It just, you know, you have to have that kind of, that wave, you know, you have to, you have to know the, the crap times to understand the good times, you know, I really yes. do believe that. And um, it's, uh, in my own experience, I can, that's all sometimes I can hold on to is that knowing that it will pass, you know, and understanding that when I'm really up there, I will come down, you know, and and uh, and and to kind of prepare yourself for that, you know. Sometimes you get caught short. <laughs> yes, I know. That's that's the thing, isn't it? Having that awareness. But as the eighties progress, because because um, just jumping subject. But you know, as we were going through, because I was a real indie kid. You know, I loved that kind of world, and I suppose I was at that age where you know it was like you you kind of realise this is happening. You're at sixteen, eighteen, whatever, and and you know the music is kind of everything, and you kind of discover bands who haven't you know just got their first singles out. So what was the eighties like for you? <clears throat> um, so. Uh... <clears throat> So the 80s were, were, I mean, the early 80s were, you know, I, I left school, um, as far as I can remember, I think it was around 82, somewhere like that. So that was when the Jam had that farewell tour, wasn't it? I think they finished yeah. on Bright, Bright in 82, December. Yeah, 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 yeah. We went to the Wembley Arena shows. Um, yeah, I mean, it was kind of like, obviously, like, uh, I, I was kind of very... Um, um disillusioned at school um and and that period of when you're coming towards the end of the school and it's like you know you're being you're being kind of asked what do you want to do for the rest of your life you know and i i i just was clueless i like i mean i wanted to be a footballer you know but that was never going to happen because i had uh, physical problems that weren't ever going to allow that to happen you know um and and then I had to think about well, what do I do? And you know, you know, it's kind of like <clears throat> you've got to think of uh some kind of career. And I and I I I didn't have one, you know, I didn't want to be a I didn't want to be a tradesman, I didn't want to be a painter or a joiner or a bloody um bricklayer or or anything like this, you know, um things like uh lawyers. Uh, solicit, uh, solicitors, lawyers, accountants, banking, you know, and uh, kind of upper management things were like, you know, never, never, ever kind of spoken about or encouraged or, or even you was led to believe that you would have any chance whatsoever of, of doing anything, you know, other than a trade or a, a, a menial job, you know, sort of thing. Mm. Um, and I wasn't really interested. In the end, I settled on uh, motor mechanics because I like cars. Um, I left school early. I didn't take any exams. And I was just really disillusioned with everything. And I, like my path basically started to follow um, smoking lots of weed, doing what I had to do to earn money to buy some weed <laughs> <laughs> and then buy the food that the weed made, made me want to eat. <laughs> um, uh, and and then I started dr kind of drinking. I was kind of like a, 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 a bit late, but but then it was all about getting into the pub, you know, going to football matches, getting into the pub when you was like 15 and seeing if you could get to a club or a party or something, you know. And um, so that was kind of like the early sort of to mid 80s. And then around about, 
85 sometime, I kind of caught a, a lucky break. I was always writing stuff. I would always write kind of what I would sort of, it, it kind of took not a lot of form really. It was either poetry or songs or something, but I'd never kind of, what I always found it difficult was to finish right. whatever it was. So I'd end up with loads of kind of like bits of writing everywhere, you know, and I built up loads of it over, over the time. Um, and then um, a friend of mine, he used to roadie with a clash um, and went quite a few places with them and stuff. And, uh, and out of the blue, he, he, he got a job working with um, Topper out of The Clash, the drummer, on his solo album. Uh, this was right 1985. Yeah. And so, uh, th this friend was a couple of years older than me. Um, and he got a job as Topper's personal assistant, basically. So he would have to go and get Topper up, take him to the studio, um, and uh, just basically run him around and whatever. So he kind of got me on board as like a tea boy and so out of nowhere I found myself working for Topper out of the Clash. Clash was one if not my favorite band at that point one of them most definitely yeah. um, and I got introduced to this lifestyle this music world lifestyle. Um, I think I tried to get a couple of jobs prior to that in a couple of rehearsal studios, but I knew nothing about the technical side of music. I couldn't even play an instrument, you know, but I was becoming more kind of, uh, kind of more interested in it, you know, in, in the mechanics of bands and songs and instruments and things, you know. Um, so anyway, I found myself in this situation where I'm sitting in this studio in the Highbury, and it's Wessex studio where they recorded London Calling and Never Mind the Bollocks um, with Topper. And I've got the use of this um, Chopper motorbike. I've got the use of this BMW, which are his. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I'm being sent on errands, you know, which is great. But like, we're basically lounging around this studio. Um, now I'm like, 17 years old or something and um all of a sudden i'm sort of introduced to this world of like substances and kind of alcohol and it's all free and you know and and like sitting there watching this great big tv and stuff and just seeing how this music business operates kind of thing you know the process of recording and and uh, meeting these musicians, like he got a, a guy called Jimmy, Hel Jimmy Elms, who uh, sang Gonna Make You an Offer You Can't Refuse, which was quite a massive record, you know, and I didn't know who he was, but I knew the record, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it was just fascinating. And I just, all of a sudden, I, I, I want to work in this business. You know, all of a sudden that, that, feeling that I should have had at 15 at school, like I want to be a bricklayer or something, which I didn't have. All of a sudden I was experiencing it at 17 years old. All of a sudden I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in the music business. I didn't know what as or how or where I would start, but I knew I wanted this lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> and I remember watching Live Aid at, at, at the studio at Wessex and we were yeah. just, you know, it was this ridiculous sofa, which was like a double bed, but it was a sofa, you know, and we'd be laying there sort of stoned and just <laughs> watch it. And, and I just, you know, life, life had sort of started for me. So, um, so it was kind of like that, but that was like the sun rising on the eighties for me. Do you know what I mean? It was like up until that point, it was just, it was kind of like dreary, sort of like Thatcherite Britain sort of do what you kind of got to do to make some money, you know, and, and, I, and I've probably had a variety of jobs. I've been a dispatch rider. I'd worked in the building game. I'd been a foot messenger. Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd uh, probably tried my hand at painting or something. I'd worked in a fruit market, you know, all up until that point, you know, yeah, I'd yeah. done wh whatever I, whatever I'd, I kind of fell into basically. Um, and, uh, and and then the, the picture changed slightly 
from that point on. Um, it got to, um, I started to pick up the drumsticks, uh, highly, very, very influenced by Topper. He never gave me any lessons. I think he might have given me one or two, but um, never anything that kind of stuck in my head sort of thing. But I started picking up the drumsticks and I started playing at local youth centres. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, and then uh, all of a sudden Acid House happened. Yes, this is true because because I because because I was you know obsessed with the indie scene and I loved that kind of period of you know eighty three to eighty seven which was basically the years of the Smiths that was when indie pop yeah. was kind of that yeah, thing yeah, but yeah. then then they split up and then Acid House and Ecstasy came along and it was almost like the sixteen to eighteen year old was suddenly like they wanted their band they didn't want somebody else's band and it was yeah, that kind yeah. of moment where you know things changed suddenly quite quickly. Yeah, 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 totally. I remember we used to go to a, a student bar in a place called Bolsover Street, which is in Fitzrovia, and it was like um, it was a it was a place where you could go and get cheap student priced uh, beers and stuff, you know. And we used to go there, and it and it was quite uninhibited, you know, um, compared to the pubs that we used to go to. You know, it was dark, and people used to dance, and you know, and it was. Uh, and it and it was it was a really nice vibe in there, you know. And I remember going there and and really get really getting into the Smiths uh, there sort of thing when it was being played, and it was all really the thing, yeah. you know, at that point. And and that would have been around, um, yeah, that would have been around about eighty five, eighty six, or something. Yes. I, I think. You know. um, and the other thing that happened in eighty five as well was uh, going to see Springsteen at um, Wembley at Wembley Stadium. Yeah. Um, and we we went on the Thursday. I think it's the only gig I've ever bought a ticket for, which was the Thursday, which was the Independence Day, American Independence Day. And that was just incredible. You know, the, the, the size and the atmosphere and just. It was just absolutely incredible. Um, and then we went back on the Saturday as well and obviously didn't pay on the Saturday, but um, went anyway. And got in to see it and I remember going right up into the the highest seats of Wembley Stadium and looking down on this mass of like 90,000 people you know and it was just they was kind of just all in unison with each other you know and it was just it was epic you know it was really really epic it was just yeah really wow you know well I I went to that gig on the Saturday to see Springsteen because um I still got my ticket and and I yeah, you know that was yeah. a sort of yeah, he was just amazing, even though I loved yeah. my indie pop and I wanted to go and watch the Bundu Boys at the Arts Centre. I did go and see yeah. Springsteen because it was that on, on the Saturday there was Springsteen. And then I went with a friend the next Saturday to Wembley to see, I went to Live Aid actually, he, he had a ticket and I went, oh, okay. Yeah, come. yeah, yeah, great. And, I, to be, and to be honest, I thought, I thought, I thought, I know people asked me what it was like. I said, well, actually, I, I thought the lineup was a bit rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, oh, these are all the bands I kind of dislike. You know, they're all kind of, yeah. you know, Spandau Ballet and, you know, yeah, yeah, Bill yeah, Collins. Yeah. But, I mean, let's face it, apart from like Bowie, the Queen, and maybe the Who, do you know what I mean? It's like the rest of it. I mean, like Nick Kershaw and sort of like, it's like, come on. But that and, was. And, um, and Adam Ant was there and he was doing yeah. his new solo album and it was like, oh my God, this is dreadful. Adam, what? play the hits, man, not, not play the new album, you know. And yeah, he missed the trick there, didn't he? He did. It was, it was kind of, you know, and, and status quo. I mean, that, you know, in a way I was, I was a bit too uptight as well when I was younger. So I was like, you know, why haven't they got Susan the Banshees? Why don't they have Aswad on? You know, I was thinking, yeah, I was yeah, really, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, they, they should be playing all these indie bands. You know, the Smiths aren't even playing, for fuck's sake. You know, and it was like, you know, yeah. Nick Kershaw and bloody, you know, yeah, but, you know, it was all about the money, wasn't it? You know, and um, well, Brit you know, yeah, from I that mean, standpoint, but, you can sort of understand it. Yeah, I mean, and Bob needed to sell the tickets. I mean, his ass was on the line. Everyone now goes, "Oh yes, of course." But at the time, he must have been thinking, "Shit, this could this could be a disaster." And, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's not a situation I would like to have found myself in. No, I think he did remarkably well actually to keep it together. So yes, yeah, so, yeah. so by eighty eight, no, eighty seven, eighty eight, things changed, didn't they? You know, bands 
suddenly started to realize the Happy Monday started to get their sound. The Soup Dragons, who were this indie band who were from Scotland, yeah, yeah, suddenly yeah, yeah. became yeah. sort of big. And then you had the other stuff. I don't know, people like Adansky had started and Guru Josh yeah. and all those kind of guys. Yeah, started. Guru Josh was slightly like, like probably about a year, year sort of 18 months after sort of thing. I mean, originally, I say originally, at the point I kind of came into it was, um, <clears throat> I think it was 87, I think I kind of got introduced to it. Now, I mean, the funny thing was my, <clears throat> my bedroom, I was still living at my mum's, my bedroom would always be like kind of, you know, at least sort of like five to 15 people sort of like just lounging about, getting stoned and listening to music basically, you know, um, and, and the music was very varied. <clears throat> you had quite a few different age groups, you know, ranging from like sort of 13, 14, right up to probably like 20, 22 year olds, you know, so like their musical tastes have gone through different things, you know, um, so there, there was quite, it was quite, it's getting quite eclectic, the, the music that we'd listen to. <clears throat> and plus you was getting more confident with what you actually liked as a person, you know. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I'd be, I'd, the people would come from far and wide, um, London-wise, you know. And um, and I remember um, I'd been to uh, I'd been to Tenerife, um, and the intention was to go there and stay there and work there. And this was prior to Acid House. This was like probably a year before it. Um, and I remember meeting people. I, I went once and I stayed there for a month and I ran out of money and I, I didn't, I couldn't do the work that people were doing, which was selling the timeshare stuff oh, yeah. um, or, or basically putting on parties and promoting parties and, and stuff like that. And it was all very kind of superficial, you know, and I just didn't, that wasn't me. You know, I could have done it. I, I, had, I had the resources to do it, but I just didn't want to, you know, it weren't, weren't doing it for me. And I came back and then I went back to Tenerife and I think it was for a few weeks and I met like, I met different kind of people and, and <clears throat> these people were kind of like wearing flares and sort of like hippie-ish, you know, like kind of almost like they'd fell out of the sixties, you know, to, to some degree. Um, and it was the first time I'd used ecstasy, but it was, they was using it in a completely different way. I mean, they was using it to party with, but also they was using it to another extreme where they'd be mugging people and, and robbing people and, and, and getting involved in violence and stuff. And, and it was kind of like, it was a bit strange, you know, on, on the one hand, it was like really like a, a, a uninhibiting sort of you know it's just really like liberating to a certain sense but on the other hand it kind of it kind of seemed to sort of enhance whatever was going on with you at that time so if you was angry it'd make you more angry if you was happy it'd make you really happy sort of thing you know and that's kind of how it was being used by these guys and I, for me I, I i tried a little bit of it and i just remember this beaming smile come on my face and seeming to be really in tune with whatever music was going on um and then i came back from there um and then a, a, a friend of mine this girl she came up to me and she said you've got to come to this club she said you have to come to this club it's like a club version of your bedroom and i was like oh well that sounds interesting and um and the club was future in right. in, in london at heaven and um i went along and uh I was determined to get into this club, you know, and I got refused the first time I went up there, but I, I wasn't giving in. I had two friends with me, but they kind of threw the towel in and they went home and I was really pleased because I knew I had more chance by myself. Um, and it was like, it was just, well, I, I didn't say to them, you've got to go because I'll have more chance. They, they, I knew they would say, oh, we're going home, you know, and I just kind of let it happen. <laughs> but it was, it was something that had to be done, you know. It was like my determination was such that, like, nothing was going to stop me from getting in this club. Anyway, I got in there and I found my friend. 
um, I took half an ecstasy and um, from that point forward, my life changed. Like it was that dramatic. My life changed completely, you know, and um, and everything else followed on from there. Basically, it's like it was like a complete right turn, you know. Yeah, because it's kind of weird because there was those documentaries we've all seen where ecstasy. They say you know there was all the football hooligans from the seventies and eighties, and then ecstasy came, and it was like suddenly the terrorists has changed. So your experience in Tenerife was a bit strange then, whereas people were using it. Up. Sort of evil yeah, I mean, I must say it was this small select group, you know, um, that, that was kind of doing that. I have no doubt that probably other people were not using it in that way, you know, because yeah. there, there, there seemed to be um, this thing of people go, kind of traveling around and they, they would go to Ibiza and they would go to the Canary Islands and they'd go to Goa. And they were kind of like being transit sort of thing. They'd go come back to London for the summer, and they would be in transit basically, sort of all year round. And and these people were <clears throat> were were using the ecstasy. You know, some people financed it in certain ways. Some people financed it in other ways. You know, these guys happened to finance it by robbing and thieving and dealing. You know, and um, mm-hmm. and it kind of enhanced that experience for them. But that was like. Uh, that was only a few people, you know, it was, that wasn't like everybody that was kind of doing that, you know. Yeah, because we had the second <clears throat> summer of love, wasn't there, in 16? Yeah, but it's interesting you bring up the football thing, because I do genuinely believe that that was one of the main reasons for like a lot of the football violence in, violence calming down was, was the fact that, that everybody was taking ecstasy. Yes, that was good. You know? Those great days of Millwall, the Dell. Well, yeah, you know, and I, like when we used to go to Spectrum on a Monday night, you would you would have the same boys that would be in those fights of a weekend, you know, the actual ones that would be, you know, trying to kill each other at the weekends would be in that club at the same bar, you know, talking to each other and having a laugh with each other, you know, and it was... And it was incredible because they were the actual people that were the ones that were that they, they were the ones that were were responsible for for you know ninety percent of the violence of London football teams. Bloody Yet hell. they were all in this bar, and it so it you know some people still say no, that wasn't the case. But I visually I I experienced it, I witnessed it, you know, and I witnessed the the kind of the 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 small time of unity that they shared with each other. <laughs> It didn't last too long, you know, because obviously the the uh, the drugs, either they stopped taking them, the drugs became not so good, or you know another substance became more prevalent, which doesn't have that great an effect on people's uh, happiness. <laughs> no, this is true. So as we trucked up to the nineties, yeah, that was nineties. You know, there was the world that was the sort of the grunge scene that was happening with you know um, sort of from Seattle, and then obviously there was the dance scene as well. So were you just very heavily influenced by that kind of sudden you know the world that is, I suppose, you know, Primal Scream and you know the Stone Roses and bands like that and Happy. Well, it, for me personally, it was kind of funny because um, we. Um, like I, I, I founded Le- uh, Flowered Up with Liam, the late Liam Mayer, the singer, um, and um, so as I already said, like our musical taste was very, very eclectic. Liam and I, we, we, we had a lot in common, like that, you know, mu- music, musically, and uh, with with a lot of things, clothes and and various sort of things, you know, and um. I um I wasn't really that into indie music to be honest with you. Like um I liked New Order and I liked Joy Division and um uh but you know a lot of there was like if you take creation for an instance, there was a lot of creation bands that I couldn't stand, you know. I I was like I just that that whole shoegazing thing and like Ned's Atomic Dustbin and bands like that, I just it you know I, I just didn't get it you know and I just didn't like it sort of thing um and um we just kind of um we just kind of like did this thing that was sort of like 
made 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 us happy really yeah. you know um though i wasn't like a recording member of the band i i was a co-writer and um uh used to help out with production and and bits and pieces you know um <clears throat> like I, I i wrote the first three the first three songs of flowered up i wrote the drum tracks for them on a drum machine and uh contributed uh quite a lot of the lyrics and stuff um did the so, band come did the band come together quite quickly was there sort of a sense of everybody being on a you know kind of a mission to sort of do this yeah kind of i mean like the 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 bass the, the guitarist was liam's younger brother um and the bass player and the drummer um those three the rhythm section basically were were kicking around our estate and like playing like at parties like house parties and just that's all they did they played at, at a couple of youth centers around one in king's cross and one in uh, regent's park um and they'd get together like whenever they could and just like play instrumentals and they'd be doing like um you know hendrix and who covers like th this was all instrumental no one sang yeah yeah um, and they were they were accomplished musicians they really were and they was like a year or two younger than me and liam um and so that was there i'd play drums with them sometimes you know and, uh, while i was trying to learn the drums but the kid that was already playing with them was was so much better than me and he was of a standard that i was never going to get to and it pissed me off and i'd like i just sort of like gave it up you know <laughs> yeah um, but i'd still kick around with them from time to time you know just for the fun of it you know um anyway um so while they're doing that and playing around the estate and stuff me and liam are going to the acid house parties going out clubbing every night and like you say, the Mondays and the Roses all of a sudden have kind of come onto the radar. Even though they've been around for quite a while, they've just about come onto our radar. And the Mondays particularly, um, they uh, we kind of got to know them and, um, and they were good lads, you know. They were kind of just like us, but from Manchester, you know. And um, we went to see them at Dingwalls and they... When they brought out Bummed, they had their after party at um, Spectrum, the the club that we. I mean, I went there religiously for like two years solid every Monday night. You know, I yeah, was yeah. there, um, and so um, that was a really good night. And then we watched uh, it. In this meantime, I I'd met Jeff Barrett, who was uh, the Monday's PR and Primal Screams PR at this point, and I'd met McGee and i'd met some other people and i'd met the mondays around about the same time various people would come up to me and said to me your mate liam do you know what he'd make a really good front man to a band um and i kind of i see what they was on about you know he had something about him you know just while he was dancing around various clubs you know people would come up and say this and jeff barrett said it to me he said was, he a bit, really... was he a bit like Sting from um, Quadrophenia then? Was he was he the face? Well, no, not really. No, no, not at all. You know, he, he didn't really, you know, if you met him socially, like standing talking at a bar, you wouldn't necessarily think he had anything about him sort of thing. But there was just something about him when he danced in, in the Acid House Club sort of thing. It was just, he just had something about him, you know, it's that thing you can't put your finger on, you know, but it's just, it's, it's, it makes itself apparent. Um, yeah. Whatever you want to call it, you know, but it was intriguing that like they'd say this. So I, I never said it to him because uh, there wasn't a reason to sort of thing. But then we went one night, we went and saw me, Liam and his girlfriend, we went and saw the Stone Roses at Dingwalls. And I can honestly say it's, if not the best, it's one of the best gigs that I've ever seen in my life. It was mind blowing. Um, and we came away from that gig that night, really high, like just on the gig, you know. Um, and uh, we went back to Liam's flat. And this is when I proposed to him that he, join um his younger brother 
and and the other two musicians and sing and make a band. Um, and and he 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 said, no, well, don't be silly. I can't sing. And I said, well, neither could John Lydon or Joe Strummer. I went or to Scott Dillon. Dillon. <laughs> or Bob Dylan. It's irrelevant, you know. Yeah. And and we kind of mused over this sort of like, do you think? I said, yeah, you be the singer. I'll be the manager. And he went, all right, let's do it. Like. And and so we decided, and and then we went and told the other three, and like before we knew it, three songs were written, um, and we was really sort of buzzing, and um, and then we kind of formed the idea of uh, putting a band into the party scenario, the acid house party scenario, you know, because where we'd come from, watching live bands and being into kind of very different music to what was being played well not so different really because like a lot of the music was being played at the clubs we went to was quite eclectic you know because it wasn't all just like stomping acid house music you know they was playing stuff like the the wooden tops and um oh, yeah. <clears throat> um thrashing doves and you know and like <clears throat> you know they played like cindy lauper's cover of what's going on and and there'd be you know a lot of the chris rear stuff and you know it was kind of it was quite varied, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, and um, and we, me and Liam would say, like, you know, the clubs are great, we love it, you know, but at the end of the day, visually, a DJ doesn't cut it, you know, um, and, and the visuals can only go so far. There's nothing that sort of gives you the same kind of buzz as seeing a live band, you know, there's, there's nothing that represents that aspect in a in a acid house club you know a live pa where someone's miming in a mic for one of their songs that you hear every other week that it's not the same thing you know no. so um we can't kind of come up with the idea that like wouldn't it be great if we could just drop the band into the acid house scenario but like it wouldn't be advertised people would know about it word of mouth obviously but like we'd try and drop it in so basically the dj cuts into the band starting their first song. So not actually mixing it in, but the DJ just cuts, band goes, you know, does three songs, band off, DJ back on. And so you literally like kind of throw it on the audience unsuspectingly, you know, and you've got, you know, we're going to parties with like a minimum of 300 people up to like a thousand people at some of the parties, you know, um, and we was talking about those parties. We wasn't talking about doing the kind of energy raves and like those kind of monstrous uh, airplane hangar raves. You know, that wasn't that wasn't yeah. what we was about. You know, it was about this kind of doing it like underground at these parties that we went to, you know, uh, in front of our mates, basically. So we knew we had, had a ready made audience. And. Um, and so once we'd written these three songs, Liam came up with the name Flowered Up. I, I, I designed the logo for it. And all of a sudden it all came together. Um, yeah. And it, this was really quick. You know, I, I can't say how long it took, but it was like, you know, a couple of months from like me putting it to him in his, in his flat that night to all of a sudden we've got three songs. <clears throat> um, I've told Jeff Barrett. Jeff Barrett's decided he's going to, uh, do a label and next thing we're doing a photo shoot on top of um, some buildings in Gray's Inn Road in central London and um, we're, uh, we're, we're by this time we've written a few more songs and and uh, we're gonna we're gonna and we did we, we, before that happened obviously we did the the gigs we did um, the first ever gig was a, a, a club night under um, the hotel at Paddington Station and our friends of ours had put on a, a club night there called Kazoo and it was December 1989 and we did it we, we dropped the band in for three songs basically the DJ went off the band came on for three songs off DJ back on and right. we did it and it was, it was a roaring success there was only like I think it was about 300 people in there that night but everybody wanted to be part of it you know and uh and it was just, I mean, the band were probably crap. I can't quite remember, you know, it was very, <laughs> very ramshackle, you know, but, 
but it worked you know it really worked and then we did it again in january uh, at a venue called the africa center in covent garden and it was another friend of ours putting a night on there's probably about six to eight hundred people in this one and um by this stage the music business had caught wind of this thing that was flowered up and they all wanted to know what it was you know so it became uh the one where people were like offering a hundred pounds to get into this party to to catch a glimpse of this band so they could be the first ones in it this is major record labels you know and, yeah yeah and, uh we we hadn't even like we at that point we had no idea of putting out a record or anything you know we'd just done these two kind of guerrilla gigs you know and um and it had gone bananas you know and um and it was brilliant and so obviously uh we we uh plotted and planned with jeff at that point and and uh then uh we got to releasing um it's on on heavenly yes which was which was that the kind of when you look at it now was that the very honeymoon period because though the the the, the period with heavenly sounds like it was the where everything was kind of going very well for the band well yeah 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 and coming back coming back to like your original question like the the the, the weird kind of side of it was that, like, I suppose if I'm honest, I'm not really sure I actually even like that song, It's On, um, and and all of what it represents, like, that whole indie dance thing. You know, don't get me wrong, I love Screamadelica and I love that album. I think it's brilliant, you know. Um, it's a seminal album, you know. But, like, this whole thing of, like, indie dance and indie bands having these remixes done yeah um and it became de rigueur you know like and we did it you know we did it with our songs you know we did that thing you know and um and i remember i can remember some nights after gigs we do we do around the country and it would be the indie dance disco afterwards you know and and i remember re really being like really hating some of the songs that were coming on you know like i can't even tell you what they were but that they they i just was kind of a, for us it was kind of like what we was trying to do was extend the acid house party vibe um not musically with the music we was making um we did use elements of some of that music you know with the pianos the house pianos and stuff in some of some of the tracks um and uh, obviously like the groove was was a key factor you know we wanted to make music that you could dance to you know we didn't want to so so that had to be an element to it you know but there was also the rock and influences and stuff so flowered up's output musically was was kind of like a, an influence of what everybody was into you know those as musicians um and, and liam you know liam wasn't a musician either and and the musicians, I mean, like his brother Joe was like he, he was into Hendrix and the Who. That was his thing. Um the bass player was into Rush. Right. And Classic. The drummer was into thrash metal. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily the thrash metal element didn't kind of come into it. Unfortunately, he ducked out after the first two gigs, the drummer. Um which was really a shame because he was one of the best drummers I've ever heard. Um, he demised shortly afterwards, which is a real, real shame. Um, and the drummer that we got in was unfortunately of a lesser talent than, than the original drummer. Um, but he, he was from our estate and kind of, it, it kind of worked at the time. Yes. Um, so when so you, you, you know, that's kind of been documented, this kind of the bidding war from Heavenly to, London, is it London Records that you suddenly... Yeah, it was London, London we went to, yeah. So you, you know, you did, a, was it just a few singles on Heavenly and then London? We did, to... we did the first two singles with Heavenly. We did It's On and Phobia with Heavenly. And um, by by that time, the it was getting a bit ridiculous. Um with um, the record labels and stuff. And now, I mean, we was, in hindsight, you know, we were young, 
very, very inexperienced at the music business. You know, I mean, I was like 21, 22 years old. You know, my experience was like, as I said to you, sitting in a studio in Highbury with um, Topper Heedon, do you know, you know what I mean? Which was kind of like a, a lovely introduction to it, but a very unrealistic uh, apprenticeship for a manager. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, I was just learning as I was going along, you know. Um, <clears throat> but we were young. We were from a council estate and we wanted a way out, you know. We could see the possibilities and, um, you know, and we wanted a way out. In yeah. hindsight, it, it was probably the worst thing we ever did. Um, and it probably contributed to the to the demise of the band because... You know, you put a lot of money in front of people and it changes attitudes, it changes behaviour, it changes quite a lot of things, you know. Um, we learned that the hard way. Um, but, you know, as a manager, I had five people saying to me, we need this much to pay our rent and we need like blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, before I was doing this, I was earning £300 a week selling bootleg cassettes in the market, you know, which... He was, you know, so it was kind of like became this pressurized situation where we had to earn a living out of what we was doing. Yeah. Um, the unfortunate thing was that we kind of didn't have the experience to control what we were spending on the music, you know, and, and what we were, what was value for money, you know. So we ended up spending a, a lot of money making an album which unfortunately wasn't wasn't up to um scratch you know to be honest with you um musically and song wise it was good but production wise it was terrible it really was you know it really was a letdown production wise um and we tried to run before we could walk you know and um we got swept up in that major label bullshit basically of uh, a big deal and then having the pressure of trying to make it back yeah. which we we wasn't writing like top 40 songs you know we was we you know we um that that whole indie dance thing uh which we kind of got lumped into um didn't carry as much weight uh with the record buying public as what they would have hoped do you know what i mean like so so we was in a quandary we was in a situation where we was never ever going to uh get back the money that the record company had invested um and so very quickly we kind of slid down their priority list you know um whereas what when we signed and while we was making the album we was like the we was the 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 talking band on the label you know but um very quickly once the album had come out and it was uh apparent that it wasn't going to recoup the money or anywhere near the money they invested, you know, very quickly, your calls are not taken as quickly. And, um, <laughs> yes. you know, you know and, and so, yeah, we learned very, very, very rapidly um, that we'd made a mistake, you know, really. And, uh, and, and that's what happened. Yeah. We released uh, the album and a couple of singles with London. Um, the only thing that really kept us going, I suppose, at that point was the, the press and, and the antics of the band. You know, luckily, still then, it was the weekly press, the enemy and the melody maker and the monthly mags, you know. So there was uh, the, 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 the stories and the, the anecdotes still carried quite a lot of mileage, you know, at that point. You know, I think they're pretty sort of worthless in today's media circus. Do you know what I mean? It's... it's I don't you don't really hear about you know the the madcap stories of bands these days do you no because when we were growing up it was I always remember hearing people being interviewed and they used to say you know I'm into music for the sex drugs and rock and roll I think there was some time in the last 10 20 years someone said don't keep saying the sex bit because we probably you know <laughs> it probably wouldn't be good we'd probably be in jail for various things so you know music was quite different when we were growing up though wasn't it it was almost you know the whole thing with the you know sex drugs rock and roll groupies it was all yeah. there but we but we didn't we didn't see it because there wasn't the social social media and people didn't have all these cameras and, and yeah, all their yeah, phones yeah, yeah, yeah. so people yeah, you know totally. the, the, the stories of debauchery and wrecked hotels 
you know, just didn't get that well publicized and people could just go, well, that's, that's what it, it is. There wasn't a, oh, this is terrible. It's like, well, that's what about being in a band is all about. But yeah. what, what was quite interesting, because during that time, there was a, I don't know if you can remember, there was a guy called Murray Lachlan Young, who was a poet and he got signed for a million pound. And suddenly, you know, it, I think it was with EMI and he suddenly, here's a million pound, he became a million pound poet. And, and I did an interview with him and he said quite recently, and he said that it was horrendous because one for one minute you were there, you had all this money, everything happening. And the next minute, the record label just literally pulls everything out and you've got nothing. And he just said, yeah. he just, he lost his mind. He just, he, he went, <laughs> he lived in a wood for three years and just kind of came out when his brain was slightly together again. But he said yeah, that, yeah. that effect of, of that experience was horrendous. You know, that yeah, one yeah, minute yeah. you're so supported and everybody's around you and everybody's trying to help you. And the next minute, suddenly the management come in from a record company and just go, right, clear everything you know that guy's yeah. out you know yeah 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 totally yeah it's that it's ruthless you know it really is and um and it's also you, you kind of <clears throat> you know you start seeing um you start seeing like the intricacies of like how a record company works and the people that make it work you know and and you start to realize that like um these people they couldn't hold a candle to the likes of jeff barrett you know and like um with jeff you've got like you've got a fan you know he's, he's someone who like even if he wasn't doing his job he'd probably be working in a record shop or he'd, he'd be spending all his wages on records and music you know it's like uh it's it's his life it's important to him you know and it's uh and it's not it's not for um it's not for brownie points you know it's not like you know it's not to impress anybody or anything do you know what i mean it's just what he loves you know but then like you get these people working major record labels and um probably some independent labels these days as well who, who actually like they they you know they might they might tell you that they like something or whatever or be into whatever or so but they really don't have a clue about music like about the feeling you get from music about the importance of music in social societies and on cultures and things like that you know they have no idea um yet these people are in a position to pass judgment on music that you might be making you know or music you might be presenting to them you know and and you start to realize that like the people that are like responsible for like um furthering your career really all they all they are there for is that check in the bank every month you know they don't they'd be doing a different job in a different um a, a different profession you know if they was offered like a hundred quid more a month you know it was it wasn't that important to them that it was the music business do you know what i mean but while they're in it they're going to make out that it's very very important you know yeah. they're going to try to try to come across like they're very hip and very up on what's what's going on where you don't really you don't really care what's hip and what's going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> They're trying to impress all of the time, you know, and 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 we started to really like I suppose we started to really regret that the fact that we'd kind of left the uh, the heavenly family, you know, as as what it became to be recognized as, you know. Um we still we still had uh, Jeff doing our press. You know, we didn't sort of cut the ties completely, you know, Je and Jeff was still really, really important uh, mm. for his opinion, you know, and like anything that got made or like questions and stuff. You know, I wouldn't go to London Records, I'd go to Jeff, you know, like as soon as we had demos and stuff, I'd take them to Jeff first, do you know what I mean? And like, yeah. and then, <clears throat> and you know, there's just one, there's one example that I'll give you, which is, um, to me just sums it all up really um so i don't you familiar with uh flowered up songs yes so the track take it that we released as a single um which was the second single i think for london records um it might have been the first actually it might have been the first single and then we re-released it's on after that i think um anyway that track take it it's not a sung chorus the chorus is instrumental in that track right 
So this is the single we've decided on for London Records. They said, but it hasn't got a chorus. And we said, yes, it has. And they said, but it hasn't. And we said, what you mean, it hasn't got a sung chorus. And they said, well, yeah. And we said, well, so what? And they said, well, don't you think it needs to have some words written to it? And we said, why? It hasn't got words written to it. That's not how the song was written. Like, so why do all of a sudden do you need words to make it a chorus? And they were like, and from our point of view, it's part naivety, but part like, well, this is the song we've written. This is how it is. Why do you need to change it? You're just like bowing to a formula that you like, you know, <clears throat> believe is tried and tested and probably does work, but that's not what the song is. You know, people who know the band know what it is and, and that's how it is kind of thing. So they said, well, so Liam even bowed to, to like the pressure from them and, and started to write some lyrics, but it just wasn't happening. You know, it was kind of like, it's not, you know, it wasn't written that way. And it's like, we, we can't manufacture this chorus for it sort of thing. It's not, because that song lyrically was taken from uh, a track in the film Rude Boy. Oh, yes. um, yeah. And it was taken from that little piano piece that Joe Strummer sings while Ray Gange is dancing around in the rehearsal studio. And he's singing, ain't got no reason to drag around. I'm the wrong kind of colour in the right part of town. And he's just doing the thing. So, like, 50% of the lyrics are Joe Strummer's and he's credited for it, right? And that's where that song came from. So... There wasn't, we couldn't write a chorus for it. There was just, it just wasn't happening. So, um, so then they suggested, well, what about some backing vocals? And we're like, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, let's like, you know, a, a woman's voice would be really good to like lift it up, you know, and like kind of, and we're like, no, listen, we're not writing a chorus for it. You're not putting any backing vocals on it. That's the track. That's how it's coming out. And they were sort of like, okay, okay. <clears throat> so it was a Sunday morning and we're recording in, in uh, Ill Pie Studios, which is Pete Townsend Studio over in Twickenham, right? Um, and it's a Sunday morning, the band aren't in, but I drive over there to go and have a listen to something or go and see the producer or, or some, I, don't, I can't remember why. I went over there and it's like 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. It's January, it's winter and I kind of like, so I walk in there and as I walk into the studio, I can hear this like woman's voice coming out of the mixing room, right? <laughs> and it's kind of like, woo, ah, ah, ah. like, I'm like, fuck's that, right? So I go, I go into the mixing room and lo and behold, there's the producer with the A&R man from London Records and this blonde woman in the recording studio putting backing vocals on our track, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> oh, oh, Des, oh, right, um, yeah. Right. I went, what are you doing? We, we look. We just thought we'd just see how it sounded. And I, I went, get her out of there, right? Get her out now. <laughs> you fuck off, right? <laughs> Take her with you, and don't come back, right? Until we ask you to. And it's, but that to me, like, just summed up the whole mentality of like the the major label um, <clears throat> scenario. You know, like it was kind of like. They didn't really care what they'd bought. Do you know what I mean? Like they bought it because it was the hip thing. It was the thing that everybody was shouting about was flowered up at that point in time, you know, and they wanted to sign it before CBS did, you know, before like <clears throat> Universal did, you know, and like, and they probably would have threw anything at me to sign it, you know, um, the figures that they sort of threw at us were just monumental to us at that point in time, you know, which is why we signed a deal. Uh, to be honest with you, they probably weren't the best label that we could have gone with London Records, you know, they presented themselves as, but 
<clears throat> you know, it was really like we signed with them because they offered us the most money. That was the simple bare fact of it. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, you know, I don't know. A lot of indie bands I've interviewed, Often the first album is on the indie label, and then it's like, Christ, what do we do next? And it's like Virgin or somebody else has said, look, you know, we'll, we'll sign you. And, you know, and Virgin has that image that they do. And then they, they get a producer they don't like, and then they get told, could you kind of, I don't know, one band, <laughs> one band was like, could you support Take That? And it's like, what? We're an indie band. We want to sound like <laughs> REM. We, we, we want that. We don't want to be to support and take that. Yeah. You yeah. know, it was that kind of, they were just like, oh my God. And it was, you know, several bands was like, actually, they just met in the pub and said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. We're just going to split yeah, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it literally, it destroys bands. You know, it really does. It, it's kind of like the the non-understanding and, and the uh, commercial desperation of major record labels. You know, it, it does, it, it's probably destroyed so many bands over the years, you know. I won't hold them wholly accountable for our demise, you know, because there was a lot of factors. Um, but they definitely played a part in it, you know. They yes. definitely played a part in it. Well, I think it's always, it's, 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 well, with most bands, they don't go beyond, you know, the runway, do they? Whereas when you do take off, suddenly I don't think anybody's prepared particularly for what's going to happen next. And the whole thing is such a trip from what I can gather, that you just think, oh, Christ, what do we do next? What do we, and then suddenly, you know, you're sort of, it's all over, isn't it, almost? And unless you're yeah. sort of, ba uh, unless you're a band like you 2 or somebody like that, who seems yeah, to be able yeah. to do it, I mean, most bands do cr crash. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, when, when like, the dust settled a little bit, and, like, we'd, we'd uh, promoted the album, and uh, we, we all of a sudden, we was kind of like, well, how the fuck did we get to this point? Like, how did we actually write those songs? You know, where did they come from? Like, what's, wh where's the form, like, where, where's the, where's the method? You know, what, what, how did, how did we create this, this batch of work? Do you know what I mean? Like, and it, it, we was a bit clueless, you know, to be honest with you. And, and that's what led to, um, like, the, that's what led to us, to the band going in the studio, we decided to put them in a studio outside of London because um, we, we had this little studio in in, a, in a Elephant and Castle called the Sunday School that we used to rehearse at and uh, where all that gear was stored, you know, all the equipment. And, um, and that's where the band would just jam around and sort of like, you know, we'd rehearse for gigs and whatever. But um, it was central London and obviously the drug element had become pretty firm and fixed um, within the band. Uh, and it was a problem, you know, and uh, we, we needed to get away from certain influences or try to at least, you know, and, and, and try to make it more concentrative on the writing and the band, you know. So we decided to go to a, a residential rehearsal facility in Sussex and uh, we booked two weeks out basically for the band just to live there and that's all they had to all they had to think about was getting up in the morning going into the studio or wherever and writing songs playing yeah. playing them instruments and writing songs you know they was getting fed uh the bedroom was just like up the stairs you know it was kind of like treat this is your house but someone's going to cook for you just write songs that's all you got to do <clears throat> but they like we was like well they didn't know how to write a song you know and um where to start kind of thing you know and it was it was sort of like well how did we how did those songs come about because they come about in in different ways like i said the first three songs uh came about a, a, of a weekend in my flat where like i contributed some lyrics liam expanded on them uh, we told the guitarist what to play and the bass player what to play. I wrote the three drum tracks and, and they sort of fell into place, you know. Um, how the others came about was a mishmash of various sort of like different things. Yeah. But um, out of uh, this two weeks, we got Weekender. Um, but that came out of the studio as a 45 minute long jam basically with like a few lines of lyric sort of splayed about here and there and um and that's what we came out with that was the sum total of this two weeks you know there might have been a few other little bits of like <clears throat> uh, a few riffs here and there and like you know maybe a few 
lines of something else, like lyrically. But that that's what they came out of that two weeks with was this 45 minute jam, which went through like several styles of music. <laughs> 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 but it was like, but we all we all knew that within it was something that was quite monstrous and like quite uh, unique, you know, and 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 was a step forward musically. Um, and um, and 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 the rest of it was quite bizarre because uh, it was the the, the part in shock from London Records was uh, the A&R man that I'd caught in the studio trying to put the backing vocals on that uh, track a year earlier. He suggested uh, working with Clive Langer. And we we was like, I think mainly because it was his idea. We was kind of like, yeah, no, thanks. You know, he's like, <clears throat> he works with madness and he's about 50 years old and like we, we want someone young and like, you know, on, on our level sort of thing. And, and and we kind of did, was a bit dismissive, but we met Clive. And as soon as we met him, it it was a complete turnaround because uh, we we all got on with him so well. And, and like musically, he was he was there, you know, he, he, he knew the score sort of thing. And um, and he started going to some rehearsals and stuff. And, and, and that's how Weekender got like edited down to like this 12, 30 minute uh, thing that it is now. Um, was through uh, the band working with Clive and uh, a lot of Clive's input, you know. <clears throat> um, so it was quite ironic that like that, that part in suggestion had been from London Records. Because of course, when we took London Records back, this 13 minute track, their first response was like, right, we need a radio edit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Three and a half and minutes. We were like, what? We need a radio edit. And we was like, that's it's just not gonna happen. You know, that really ain't gonna happen. It's like this, this it's it's uneditable. You know what I mean? You're not gonna get three and a half minutes out of this that makes any sense. And they were like, Well, what you know, what do we do? And we'd like don't know just put it out as it is you know and they, and they, at that point um jeff had obviously formed some relationship with uh sony um and uh rob stringer and um and jeff was just like so into it you know he really was and uh some things got done and by uh by some some miracle really we managed to get out of the london deal sony bought us out of the london deal and agreed to put out weekend uh, on heavenly as it was you know and um it was just uh it was just incredible yeah it really was a, a classic <clears throat> but the, yeah at that, at that stage you was you're almost poised in that per perfect position that was going to be or then began to progress into Brit pop, wasn't it? I mean, you know, it was like the yeah, band. yeah, 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 very much on the verge of that. Yeah, um, unfortunately, the 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 band was ravaged by drugs at this point. Um, uh, actually, writing anything was um, was becoming secondary to getting various people clean. Um, you know, the priority had sort of like changed. Um, it was more a necessity to get people clean and uh, back functioning like in, in, in normal world before we could move forward, you know, and, and it wasn't happening. And it's just, unfortunately, now I've learned when that happens, you're fighting a losing battle, you know, you really are. And it's, uh, unless, the individuals are, are, have got enough about them to carry on with the music and still be able to write and produce music even through their addiction or whatever. It's it becomes it becomes the 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 band becomes a passenger, you know, and um, to them, you know yes. what I mean. And, and likewise, they become a passenger to the rest of the band, sort of thing. And and uh, it was just too ravaged by drugs and and. What what had become apparent was that musically 
um, the band hadn't moved forward. Um, it kind of was was a bit stuck in, inspirationally, you know, and and um, the musicians we'd 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 lost the uh, the bass player and the drummer. Uh, the second drummer had gone. Uh, the bass player, the original bass player, he left prior to that because he he couldn't work with a drummer anymore. And he said, well, either I go or he goes. And we let the bass player go, which was our second fatal mistake because he was an integral part of the band and one of the original members. And we should have really stuck by him and we let him go. Um, yeah. So by the time we could, Weekend had come out, we had a new rhythm section and they was actually the, the, the new drummer we had, which was an old friend of mine from secondary school, a guy called Andrew Island, who was a brilliant drummer, like a natural, brilliant drummer. And the bass player we had, we, we was in a position musically to start moving forward. Um, but the guitarist Joe and Liam the singer were completely and utterly ravaged by drugs and it just wasn't happening. Um, we managed one more song after that, which was um, Better Life, which was the, the reggae track that uh, Heavenly did a limited release of after Weekender and, and, and that was it. Um, yeah. it, just, uh, it just wasn't happening. Yeah. yeah, so that 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 kind of um, unfortunately is is what happened. And then and then what do you do? You know, how do you sort of kind of pick yourself up from that kind of experience? Because obviously it's such a been such an intense but quite short lifespan, and then suddenly having that kind of walking away from it and thinking, God, what happens next? Do you sort of yes? How do you navigate that moment? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was it was fast, wild, and 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 really high, you know, and um, and uh, <clears throat> it it for me personally, I spent about a year in the wilderness, like dealing with my own addiction, um, and and never kind of lost touch completely with a lot of the friends I'd made, sort of like through that period. And I knew that I wanted to stay in the music business. I knew that I wanted to work in music and, and still manage bands and, and promote stuff and, and be involved. Um, even though Flowered Up was dead in the water, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't functioning at all, you know, and, and uh, Liam had said that he'd had enough. He, he was kind of, uh, you know, it wasn't fun for him anymore, you know, and, and so he just gave it up basically and so the rest of the band kind of folded there was no question of ever trying to replace Liam because it was you know it'd be like trying to replace Strummer it was too unique you know what I yeah. mean it was like in in that respect you know um uh so um I I kind of um from that point I um I began to manage Paul Cannell the painter the guy who did the scream of delicacy sleeve, he yeah. decided. I, I began to manage him as an artist painter, um, but somewhere in the, in the next year, he decided that he didn't want to be a painter anymore. He wanted to be a, a rock and roll musician and singer songwriter. So that's what he did. He 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 could already play drums and play a bit of guitar, and he started writing songs. And that and he he developed a band, <clears throat> and. Um, I started working with them, um, got them signed to creation. I managed uh, Anna Haig for a while, who did some backing vocals with us um, and did the Boca Junior stuff. Yeah. I started managing Tash, who worked at Heavenly, who's a singer songwriter. And, um, and I started taking it a little bit more seriously, you know, and um, obviously applying a lot of the stuff that I'd learned through the Flowered Up experience. Um, and then I uh, took on another band, which was called Generation of Peace, which unfortunately is the only band that I never got signed. We were really good, but was like this kind of <clears throat> nine piece band that was like a kind of rap dance band from all over. Some of the guys were from your way, actually, from Norwich and oh. around there. Yeah. Um, and um and some were from Brixton, and, and and they were brilliant. They were really good, and I very almost got them signed to um, Ultimate Records, where <clears throat> um, I think Dodgy were, I think. Um, but unfortunately, 
uh, egos got involved and kind of things became very complicated and all of a sudden they dispersed and um, that didn't happen. But so I carried on with Paul and his band, Crawl, who signed to Creation. And um, and then I found this uh, young band. A guy gave me a cassette tape when cassette tapes were still around. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, it had three songs on it. And it was this band from um, Crouch End in North London. And um, I was just blown away by their ability. They was only 15 and I was blown away by their ability at 15. And I just thought, well, if they can do what they can do at 15, what would they be like at, you know, 18, if they're yeah. still together and functioning as a band, you know? And uh, I went to see them in rehearsal and stuff and I took them on. And, uh, and uh, we started developing them and uh, promoting them and stuff. And eventually, I um, I teamed up with a guy called John Bryce, who was uh, a publisher, who had become a quite a really good friend, um, and uh, we called ourselves Evolution Management, and we had this band. We called them South, and uh, we signed them to Mowax through Beggar's Banquet, and it was the first band that Mowax had ever signed, oh, like yeah. live band. And then by this stage, we was. Managing Monaco, Shara Nelson, uh, Pete Wiley, um, the band South, and a few other little bits and pieces. And uh, we had offices in Kentish Town, and all of a sudden it felt like I was actually working in management properly, you know, yeah. and like because I never really had an office before. Like I worked out of my old bedroom in my mum's place, you know, and uh, uh, although I had management company names and headed paper and all of that, it was kind of like it never, it always seemed a bit kind of off the cuff, you know, sort of yes. a bit, bit Del Boy, if you like, you know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I got to that position um, and it was good for a few years, you know, it was really good. And, and then uh, Basically, I got to the point of like early 2000s, a couple of things went wrong and um, and I just got tired of, of um, not being able to trust people. And I got tired of going around playing people music who I felt were not even in a position to judge the music. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. but I was kind of asking them for their opinion when I didn't even really want it, but I was trying to get their label to sign it, you know, and like, and it just made me feel like, why Why should I have to, like, I would only ever work with music that I would take and put on at home, like, and gen genuinely listen to, you know? Yeah, of course. Like, I couldn't sell stuff if I weren't into it, you know? And I just got really tired of, like, trying to convince people that um, it was good and it was exciting when they just really weren't interested because it weren't the latest thing, you know what I mean? It didn't fit in with, it didn't sound like Oasis and it didn't sound like Nirvana and it didn't sound like whatever was going on at a particular time. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, um, yeah, yeah, I kind of, I walked away from the music business um, probably about 2002, I think it was. Yes. And then did Cloud Up ever reform or did they? They, they did. Yeah. And, um, so it happened, uh, it was a shame it happened actually, I think, because just prior to that, me and Liam were working on a solo project for him and he'd really got himself together and he was coming around, like as I was working with his band South, he would get on stage and do a couple of songs with them and he'd really kind of got his thing back, you know, and like he was looking good and like we was working on, some new songs with him, you know, me and him were writing songs and he was going to call himself Vegetable Man. And like, we we had like a list of songs to work on and stuff. And it was like really, really positive, you know, and <clears throat> starting getting itself together. And then um, these two guys from Birmingham who called themselves Mother, who were like really kind of like, kind of cool, like producers sort of thing. They They wanted Liam to, to guest vocal on their album. Um, and this was around the time of like Black Grape and like uh, stuff like that, that sort of time. Yeah. And, and me and Liam had gone to the Phoenix Festival together and, and like we was really enjoying things and, and stuff. And then uh, 
we got asked to put Flowered Up back together to do Loaded in the Park with Happy Mondays, which was the festival in Clapham Common. And it was, uh, it was appealing to me for one thing only, and that was playing with the Mondays, because it was something we'd always tried to make happen. But um, as much as the band, the Mondays wanted it to happen and the band Flowered Up wanted it to happen, for some reason, the Monday's manager would always like stifle it and, and be not let it happen. And we could never work out why. Anyway, it didn't happen. So this kind of got put on the table and um, and I was up for it in a certain sense. But I said I only if like the lineup was the last incarnation of Flowered Up. Um, and then... Um, it wasn't, and then there was some politics, and I just said, you know what, I'm just, like, I'm not involved. I'm not involved, and I walked away from it. Um, but they did get back together. Um, unfortunately, mine and Liam's relationship deteriorated. Um, and uh, they did that gig, and I believe they tried to write some new songs, and um, I think they did a couple of other, Pardon me, they did a couple of other gigs um, and, and then it just faded into obscurity again, which was a shame. You know, I, I thought um, it, 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 if it was done, it could have been done a lot better. Um, but I thought it really was time for Liam to move on and do it like his solo thing was quite promising, you know, and I think he would have got a lot further on his own than yeah. trying to re rehash Flowered Up, you know. And if Flowered Up <clears throat> would have come back with a load of new songs that were brilliant, then they might have uh, got somewhere. But they they just they just started off at the point that they finished at, which was like scratching their heads and didn't really know what to do. Just playing like these 12 songs that they'd played before, you know, and it didn't really cut it, I suppose. <clears throat> yeah, that must have, was that the kind of last time you'd seen Liam? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see him. I see him around like quite a lot afterwards. Um, you know, in circumstances that I'd rather not see him in, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we sort of like lost touch a bit, really, and um, we we fell out a little bit. Um, yeah, and then unfortunately, the sad news came that he died. Yeah, that must have been horrendous when you heard that, because I guess you no one ever expects it, and he was only in his forties. Well. I'll be really honest with you. Um, I wasn't surprised. Um, I really wasn't surprised. Knowing Liam as well as I do, um, I, I wasn't at all surprised. I was very, very sad, very sad. Um, but I was not surprised at all. I thought it was something that would uh, one day I would hear. Unfortunately. Yeah, that's um, you know. Were you kind of then kind of gobsmacked when Joe also died? Just no. Again, you know, I, I wasn't surprised because um, I, I knew I knew Joe, what Joe was like, and um, <clears throat> uh, as unfortunate as it was, I just <laughs> really wasn't surprised. Um, again, very very sad, you know, such a waste. But I just wasn't surprised. Yeah. And then did you, with the, you know, as you weren't in the music industry and you're sort of thinking, Christ, what happens next? Well, then, what kind of then happens for the last like ten years? Have you just sort of gone into something completely different for, for myself over the past 10 years yeah various uh things um but uh i've never kind of had that uh thrill or excitement that i got from working in the music industry to be honest with you so i found it very difficult to like hold any jobs i mean i've done bits of chauffeuring and i've done bits of building and i've done bits of this and that um <clears throat> but nothing permanent and um um kind of fixated on scuba diving for a while and i wanted to work within the scuba diving industry and um kind of never made that happen unfortunately got quite some way but never made it happen um and then recently more recently i've been trying to write stuff um so i've been uh trying to write a book and I, i've I've been trying to write this book about um, myself and Paul Cannell um, and um, and holiday we took 
uh, whilst um, he was signed to Creation Records. And it was kind of like a bit of a recuperation um, holiday to inspire us or him to write songs. And uh, it never quite worked out like that. It turned into a really kind of mad experience for 12 days in Ibiza. And um, I was trying to... <laughs> I was, I was trying to write this story. So um, yeah, that's something that I, I kind of really want to do. I've not, I've not quite figured out how to um, motivate myself to be a writer yet. I'm yes. still working on it. <laughs> well, it's tricky. I mean, have you ever been tempted? Because the flowered up story is quite something, isn't it? It's, it's kind of... Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of people have said over the years, you know, that that should be something that needs to be told and stuff. but. Um, you know, there was a guy who, who recently um, he put out the book The Weekender's Tale, um, which I don't know if you see see no. or anything. Which um, he, initially uh, it, it it was the weekend, it was the flowered up story, but um, we kind of thought about it like myself, Jeff, and a few other people that were close to it, you know, and. Um, we thought about it, you know, and uh, re really like, is there a story that's book worthy there, you know, or is it just a load of anecdotes that you tell your mates in the pub? You know, um, we don't want to like, we don't want to talk of uh, Liam and Joe's demise, really. Do you know what I mean? Out of respect to them and their yeah. families sure. and stuff. Um, so what was it really? You know, at the end of the day, it was just a bunch of kids on a council estate that got a lucky break, you know what I mean? And 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 never really see it through. You know, encapsulated in that is a load of funny anecdotes, you know. Um, and that's really what the story is. And we kind of decided that, like, if it was going to be written, you know, it needs to be written by someone who knows how to write books, you know, and someone who was close to it, someone who, who, who see it. Um, see it grow you know and um and was there sort of thing you know and, and witnessed it sort of um and unless someone i think comes to me and and says i'd really like to do that like who who um has a really good understanding of of that whole time and, and the band's journey sort of thing I, I i'm not sure it's something i could do i've had i've had <laughs> a uh, bit of a time revisiting just the time with Paul Cannell. <laughs> <laughs> so revisiting the flowered up thing in intricate detail, I think would be a bit mind popping. Um, <laughs> and there's probably quite a lot of stuff that like, I probably don't really want to tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> apart from the people that were there. <laughs> yes. And, we, and did you manage to sort of clean up and, and think and get, you know, in control of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thankfully, yeah, yeah. And, and did that, that? I mean, was that quite a long process? Bringing you very, in? very long, very long process. Yeah, very long process. You know, and it's all it's ongoing every day. It's uh, it's unfortunately I suffer with addiction. You know, and um, and uh, something that I have to be aware of every day. You know, I can't take uh, I can't I can't take it for granted. You know, um. So uh, yes, it is a it's a long and ongoing process. Yeah, I mean, do you? Because because obviously, you know, the, the music industry is littered with you know people with the same you know things. Do you sort of occasionally sort of bump into people and just you have that kind of shared, shared story that you can sort of like? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's many. I mean, yeah. I mean, but it's not just within the music business. You know, there's there's that story is uh, is prevalent in pretty much every walk of life. You know. Um, <clears throat> but yeah definitely within the music business um so like and you know i i i still in con i'm still in contact with quite a lot of people and um you know um uh, from time to time we would see each other you know uh, like obviously this past year has just been a washout completely but it was funny i was um i was doing uh, a little bit of security work and i i worked at glastonbury um and um 
I spent the weekend there working like as a, a security guard and it was it was strange because like I felt like I shouldn't be there in that capacity you know and um and so uh I decided that I was never going to do that again but I would still go to Glastonbury like and um so obviously not this summer past but the summer prior <clears throat> I, I went and it was the first time that I'd gone to Glastonbury and, and done it completely straight. Um, yes. Which was a, it was probably about the best Glastonbury I've ever been to. Um, because I can remember all of it. Uh, I had a great time with loads and loads of mates that I haven't seen for a long, long time. Uh, I covered so much ground and <laughs> actually got to see so many different things like bands and, and stuff like that, which, you know, I would have missed because I would have probably been just going to bed or like, you know, just collapsing in like wherever I was standing or whatever, you know, and, and it was, it was remarkable, you know, and, and the amazing thing to be walking around the stone circle at like 10 o'clock on a Monday morning with all the fallout from the whole weekend but yeah. like I'm completely clear headed and like I'm looking in on this world that once I would have been part of was, was quite something, you know, it was really, really, it was really intriguing. Um, so like, like, you know, yeah, I do, I do get to see people and share those stories and stuff. And, um, but it was really nice, like kind of just being on the peripheral of like that being involved in, in, the the kind of getting high and and stuff and uh, but then still being there do you know yes. what I mean and still sharing it it was brilliant I really 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 loved it yeah um, yeah it was great that's amazing isn't it so look I know it's a bit of a tricky one but do you I mean um, I mean if you could have said something to an eighteen year old self you know just like that bit of advice that you kind of wished you could have had yourself or something that you've kind of learned over the decades. You know, and you thought, God, I could, you know, just a couple of things I would just like to would say to anybody, even if they don't listen. I just wonder what you would, your sort of key message would be. Uh, I suppose it would be something like be like take pride in what you do and try and be the best at, at, at whatever it is you do. You know, learn your trade. You know, take your time to learn your trade. Like. Um, uh and and do it for the right reasons whatever yeah. those reasons are you know like for us it was because we we enjoyed it you know we it made us happy and and uh we enjoyed it you know and, um, i've tried to always yeah for some people that's not you know it's not possible to do that they, they've got other pressures in their lives that lead them to have to do jobs that they don't want to do, you know what I mean, and and stuff. I, I believe you've always got a choice, you know. Um, <clears throat> um, so I think it's important to sort of just do stuff for the right reasons, you know. Um, I've always, yeah, I've always tried to do what 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 I enjoy doing because I know I'll do it better. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, I know. And it's more. It's more prevalent today at the age I'm at today, you know, because I haven't got as much opportunity today, you know, to go and like train as this, that, and the or the other. Yeah, I, I have, you know, but but um, it's more important for me today to do something that I enjoy doing because um, I know that doing something for the sake of money. Um, and I don't have a lot of respect for money, to be honest with you. I know that I'm not going to be a millionaire anymore. Do you know what I mean? Or like, you know, it's like, um, so for me to do something for the sake of money would be <clears throat> so mind numbing, you know, and, uh, uh, and depressing. Like that for me, I've got to have some kind of satisfaction in, in whatever it is I'm doing, you know, um, so yeah, just try try and do do things for the right reasons, I suppose. Yeah. Whatever those reasons are to you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. I mean, mm. on a bit of a frivolous bit, <laughs> are you still in, in touch with many of the original the, the, the remainder members of the band occasionally or do uh, you 
not 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 so much of tim the cable player who's now in republica yeah um i talked to, to tim from time to time yeah um barry mooncolt i i talked to barry from time to time as well yeah <laughs> yes god i have to say i did like your your sort of it was the budlier wasn't it you you had as your design. yeah 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 i mean it was literally like i i took the the plant you know it has like a like about a thousand little flowers in in the cone yeah you know that forms on the plant and i took one of those little flowers and just pressed it down and drew around it and then we blew that up a, a little bit and and that's that's what the logo is i know it's, it's genius actually isn't it i really and the budlier i i did i have actually read your bit in the book and uh, yeah because it does grow out of gutters it grows in you know the building all, sites and places like that yeah backyards absolutely and, you know yeah. it just kind of and this beautiful plant appears out of the yeah, it's yeah, always yeah. in wasteland isn't it for some reason it, it, so. basically yeah yeah I don't uh, know and we adopted we, we adopted the colours as well, you know, so it was kind of like all there for us, you know, you know, like, so it kind of made sense in that respect, you know. Yes, absolutely. Well, look, this has been fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for talking to me, Des. And um, if you want, I can always send you the, the link to this when I've done it. And then, you yeah, always, please do. Yeah. Yeah, you can always use it. But anyway, look, I did. I did really enjoy the book. I, I sort of have to say I've, I haven't read every bit in it but your chapter was particularly good actually so thank you yeah yeah I, i've got some great feedback from it which is really really nice you know and i like reading the uh the the stuff prior to our bit it was has been brilliant you know it's been a real revisitation to to some times you know and they were really exciting fun times you know they really were it's like it was such it was it it, it kind of just felt like we had like a lot of things at our feet you know at that, at that point in time you know and and heavenly was so fresh and so kind of uh just exciting you know like and that that whole thing of like taking on the manics you know when you've just put out like three kind of like dance groove based records you know was such a such a brilliant thing you know like and we, we got it well, i got it you know because i insisted that the manics come and support us you know for quite a few gigs and and uh, just just to get just to see people's reactions, you know, like because they would be coming to like what they perceived as like a kind of, I don't know, like an indie dance band, you know what I mean? And then to have these four Welsh kids just blowing punk rock in their faces, like it was brilliant. Like it really was just seeing some of the reactions, you know. And, and, yeah. and we liked them. We liked the Manix. We liked the boys, and we liked their music as well. I know that was quite a nice story, isn't it? Actually, the yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Engine. Yes. Anyway, look. Well, thank you ever so much, and look, all the best. It's been a real pleasure. Thank, yeah. thank, thank, thanks for asking me to do it. I really appreciate it. Well, no, well, thank you. Well, look, take care of yourself and um, have a good year and a good Christmas. Yeah, you too. Yeah, best Christmas you can. <laughs> have a great year. Yeah. Yeah. Take care, matey. Take care. Thanks a lot, David. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. And that is how you finish a conversation <laughs> or not. I love to be fumbly at the best of times. Anyway, look, that's it. It's over. Yes. Well, hopefully you're still listening. If you're not, then you just missed the best bit. Um, that was me in conversation, was me in conversation with Des Penny from Flowered Up, the uh, story of a band and much, much more. Anyway, this is the C86 show. I'm David East. So if you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 show. And uh, it's all there. And also I've done loads of other um, interviews and you can find those all archived beautifully, well, slightly, um, on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean. Check them out. They might just change your life. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.